Nearly 4,400 unidentified bodies are discovered each year in the United States, though more than three-fourths of these people regain their identities within the first year of their discovery, it is the ones who don't reclaim their names that stick with us. This is exactly what happened to the body of a young girl discovered decapitated in an abandoned building. This is the case of St. Louis Jane Doe. Before we begin today's case, I just wanted to remind everyone that if there are any cases you want to see covered on my channel, I have a case recommendations link in the description box down below. You will also find relevant case information including contact info and case numbers in the description box. If you would like to see the sources I used in today's case, they will be included in the pinned comment in the comment section below the video. And now on to today's case. It was a cold winter day and St. Louis, Missouri, on the day of February 28, 1983. Two men had been driving nearby when their car broke down. In search of a pipe to help them fix their vehicle, the men entered a vacant building. With no luck on the main floor, they descended into the basement. In the dark depths of the building, these men lit a cigarette. In the glow of the lighter, the men discovered a disturbing scene the decapitated body of a woman on the basement floor. The body had obviously been that of a black female. She was lying on her stomach with her hands tied behind her back with red and white nylon rope. The only clothing on the body was a yellow v-neck sweater. Police were notified of the discovery and were quickly on the scene. At first, investigators thought that they may be dealing with a murdered prostitute or drug addict from a nearby housing project. Once they turned the body over, however, it became clear that the person had not yet reached puberty. They were dealing with the body of a child. Police began a search of a 16-block area surrounding the building where Jane Doe was found, hoping to recover her head. Even after a thorough search that included the sewer systems, rooftops, garbage cans, and dumpsters, the head remained missing. To this day, Jane Doe's head has never been found, which means that there are no dental records on file for Jane Doe and no facial reconstruction could be completed. An autopsy of Jane Doe's body revealed that she may have been sexually assaulted. A lack of injuries to her body led the medical examiner to believe that Jane Doe had been strangled and then decapitated. Jane Doe appeared to be well nourished, but her stomach was empty at the time of her death. There was mold growing on Jane Doe's neck wound, which was sampled and used to determine that Jane Doe had been dead for about three to five days. A lack of blood at the crime scene told investigators that Jane Doe had been killed and decapitated elsewhere. The only blood noted seemed to have been smears of blood on the stairwell walls, which were likely left as the killer carried Jane Doe's body to the basement. Officers were determined to identify Jane Doe. When she didn't match any missing persons reports, they turned to school records. Over time, police were able to account for all the girls in Jane Doe's age group who were enrolled in local schools. The investigators also checked with immigration officials, but no potential leads turned up. After this, investigators tracked down 716 young girls who were on welfare records, ensuring that none of the girls listed had gone missing. Ads were run in newspapers nationwide in the hopes of turning out leads about Jane Doe's case. Investigators seemed to eventually land on the idea that the killer was either local or had been at some point local to the area. The building that Jane Doe had been found in was not near any major highways or interstates and wasn't an area that somebody would likely stumble into. If the killer was local, they may have chosen the abandoned building, thinking that Jane Doe's body wouldn't be found, at least not until it was far too late. It was only a few months after Jane Doe's death that a woman showed up to the police precinct, claiming that she had come across Jane Doe's killer. The woman claimed that she had been invited inside an apartment of a man who then showed her a machete and a human skull. Now, the man lived only blocks away from where Jane Doe had been found. Officers were quick to investigate this lead. They headed over to the man's apartment, and upon arrival, officers were able to determine that the machete was a fake, and they were able to confirm that the skull had been sent to him by a former high school teacher from California. 
In May of 1992, a man named Danny Davis was entering his storage unit when he was stopped by a police officer. The officer took notice of a rat skull inside the storage unit. At this point, Danny told the officer that he was fascinated by skulls, and he offered to show the officer a human skull. Now, according to Danny, the skull belonged to a Navajo woman who had been killed by a tomahawk 1,100 years ago. Now, concerned that this skull may actually belong to Jane Doe, the officer had it tested. Results determined that the skull was in fact hundreds of years old. Now, in the earlier years of Jane Doe's case, investigators utilized psychics in the hopes of discovering new leads. I discussed this briefly in my recent coverage of the Christopher Dansby, Shane Walker, Andre Bryant, and Monique Rivera case that I do not put any stock in psychics' claims on true crime cases. I am still hoping to do a dedicated video to this topic of psychics and true crime in the future, and I would love to know if any of you would like to see a video like that. Please just let me know in the comments down below. Now, a group of psychics who performed a seance together determined that Jane Doe's head was on a boat in the Gulf of Mexico. This lead was checked out but ultimately determined to be a dead end. Now, one psychic had requested to physically see the evidence from the case, and officers, for some unfathomable reason, decided to mail the sweater and the rope that had been on Jane Doe's body to the psychic. The evidence then became lost in the mail, gone forever, and unable to be tested for any modern-day DNA evidence. Now, this is not the first time that I have heard of evidence in a case being lost in the mail. It's extremely infuriating to think that evidence would ever be sent to a non-investigating officer in any case. In 2002, a woman by the name of Sharon Nolte contacted investigators to tell them that Jane Doe was a Chippewa Indian named Shannon Johnson and that her killer was a drifter living in southern Texas. The woman had ultimately spent thousands of dollars investigating the case on her own and even spent $4,400 on DNA testing. The supposed leads that were dug up by this woman ended up leading nowhere. In 2001, a similar crime to Jane Doe's was committed. The body of a young black girl, this time between the ages of three to five, was discovered decapitated in Kansas City. Investigators believed that it could have been connected to Jane Doe. However, in 2005, the body was identified as Erica Green. Her mother and stepfather were eventually convicted of her murder, and there doesn't seem to be any connection or evidence of a connection to Jane Doe. In 2013, a full anthropology exam and isotope analysis was conducted by the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children and the Smithsonian Institute. The results suggested that Jane Doe was not local to Missouri, but had likely spent most of her childhood in one of the following states, Alabama, the Carolinas, Florida, Georgia, Indiana, Louisiana, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Tennessee, Texas, or West Virginia. Over the years, there have been multiple suspects in Jane Doe's case. One of these suspects was a man named Michael Foote. Foote was the uncle of 10-year-old Alfred Foote. Alfred went missing in the early morning hours of December 18, 1984, while visiting his grandmother and uncle in northwest St. Louis. Officers were able to follow a trail of blood from the grandmother's house to a vacant home at 5640 Kennedy Avenue. The blood trail had led them to the body of Alfred Foote. He had been partially concealed in a plastic bag and was under a stairwell at the back of the building his head had been severed from his body. It was quickly determined that Michael Foote had murdered his own nephew. Michael was eventually questioned by investigators about Jane Doe's case. Alfred and Jane Doe were similar ages at the time, and both of their heads had been decapitated. And in addition to this, their bodies were also dumped in vacant properties. The location of the bodies was also only approximately two miles apart. Investigators were never able to establish a link between Jane Doe and Michael Foote, however. Another potential suspect was Vernon Brown. Now, Vernon Brown was a serial killer convicted of the murders of Janet Perkins, a 9-year-old girl, and Sonetta Ford, a 19-year-old girl, both of which occurred in basements. He was also charged with the murder of 9-year-old Kimberly Campbell, who had specifically been left in an abandoned building that was owned by Brown's grandmother. At the time of Jane Doe's death, Brown had recently moved to St. Louis. If Brown was connected to Jane Doe's case, the only way to find out would be through DNA evidence as he was executed on May 18, 2005. In all, Brown is suspected of the potential involvement in 20 homicides, and St. Louis detectives did question him multiple times in relation to multiple murders, including Jane Doe's. The only murders that Brown ever confessed to were Janet Perkins and Sonetta Ford. 
Samuel Ivory also became a suspect in Jane Doe's case. Ivory had murdered and decapitated 27-year-old Deborah Lewis in Mobile, Alabama in August of 1992. After his arrest for Deborah's murder, he also confessed to decapitating Demadra Griffin and Lisa Ricks in East St. Louis. Ivory committed suicide while serving a life sentence for Deborah's murder in 1996. In 2004, detectives flew to Texas to interview Tommy Lynn Sells. Sells was a possible serial killer that investigators believe may be connected to 20 or more cases. He was nicknamed the Coast to Coast Killer. Sells was arrested in January of 2000 after he murdered 13-year-old Kayleen Harris by slitting her throat and attempting to murder her 10-year-old friend Crystal Searles in the same way. Sells was known during his time in prison for admitting to nearly any murder that he was questioned about. Though detectives did interview him, they stated that it was inconclusive. Since the interview, it seems clear that investigators do not believe there is a strong link between Sells and Jane Doe. So what are the theories surrounding Jane Doe's case? One theory among people online is that Jane Doe may have been a victim of human trafficking. If she was being trafficked, there may be a good chance that Jane Doe wasn't enrolled in school and that she had been brought to St. Louis from somewhere else, which coupled with the decapitation would make it very difficult for her to have been identified after her murder. Now, this could have been done by a stranger or even by a family member of Jane Doe's. According to information compiled by the Counter Trafficking Data Collaborative, almost half of all cases of human trafficking involving children actually involve a family member. It has been theorized by investigators that Jane Doe's killer could be related to her and may have been a parent or a primary caregiver. The reasoning for this is very similar to the reasoning in the Opelika Jane Doe case, which I covered recently. Now, no one has come forward to claim this child as their own, and she doesn't seem to match any missing persons reports, leading people to believe that in this case, she was killed by a caregiver who doesn't want her to be identified. Now, my only potential reservation with this possibility of a familial connection is that Jane Doe's body revealed no signs of previous abuse. It seems extreme for a parent or caregiver to have gone from no physical abuse to murdering and decapitating their child. It's certainly possible, but it does strike me as odd personally. It's also possible that a, another theory that we applied to Opelika Jane Doe could be relevant here. Maybe Jane Doe's mother was a victim of abuse or human trafficking herself, and she had been murdered and her body dumped elsewhere, potentially leaving no one around to identify Jane Doe or report her as missing. Another possible theory is that Jane Doe was kidnapped at some point in her life, and for some reason the kidnapper decided to murder her. If she had been a victim of kidnapping some years prior, it would have been extremely difficult to match Jane Doe to missing persons cases, especially without her head. Now, a number of people online have specifically questioned whether or not Alton Coleman could have been involved in Jane Doe's death. Coleman and his girlfriend, Deborah Brown, went on a violent murder spree in May of 1984. Their wave of crime would stretch out for two months and resulted in the attacks and deaths of multiple young girls and adults. In the end, eight people had been killed before Coleman and Brown were apprehended. Now, in my research, I was able to discover that Brown had met Coleman in May of 1993. The murder of Jane Doe occurred in February of that year. I was hoping to determine whether or not Coleman had been in jail at the time of Jane Doe's death, but I couldn't find any information on Coleman's times in prison prior to the murder spree in 84. It was clear that Coleman had a long history with law enforcement, though, prior to the crimes of 1984. Psychiatrists have described Coleman as a pansexual willing to have intercourse with any object, women, men, children, whatever. Coleman was known for tying up girls to rape them. So the tying up of Jane Doe would match Coleman's M.O. And we know from psychiatric evaluations and Coleman's own confirmed crimes that he was more than willing to attack and even murder children. However, there is no evidence that Coleman had ever decapitated a victim. That doesn't make it impossible for him to have committed such a crime, but with the number of killings on his record, it would seem strange if only only one of them involved decapitation, especially because Coleman didn't seem to be bothered with his victims being identifiable. Jane
Jane Doe had originally been buried in Washington Park Cemetery in December of 1983 in Berkeley, Missouri. In 1984, students from Livingston, Illinois raised money to provide Jane Doe with a headstone. As I mentioned earlier, Jane Doe was exhumed in 2013. This was a taxing process, however, that took years to accomplish because the cemetery that Jane Doe had been buried in was extremely unkempt. It turned out that there was a lack of proper records, bodies had been buried atop one another, and the headstone donated for Jane Doe had been placed on the wrong plot entirely. It took photos of the original burial and images from the U.S. Geological Survey, along with a lot of volunteer work to locate the exact spot Jane Doe had been buried in. In 2014, she was reburied in the Garden of Innocence in the Calvary Cemetery in St. Louis. Now, the Garden of Innocence is a portion of the cemetery maintained by a nonprofit organization, which provides memorials and burial services for unclaimed children. In 2019, St. Louis created a dedicated cold case unit, which as of September 2020 has already closed 10 cases. Now, the unit has an entire room dedicated to Jane Doe's case. Lieutenant Scott Abunchen, who is the head of the St. Louis Metro Homicide Division, has been quoted as saying, An 8, 9, 10, or 11-year-old girl doesn't go missing without people taking notice. We are now 37 years later, and I think if anyone was reluctant before to talk, now is the time to come forward. If anyone knows a little girl, maybe a family member who they suddenly lost track of and disappeared, we want to know. We are interested in anything. There hasn't been a decent tip in Jane Doe's case in 10 to 15 years, but detectives are still working to solve her murder and discover her identity. Jane Doe was a black female said to have a medium to dark complexion. She was most likely between 8 and 9 years old, stood between 4'10 and 5'6, and weighed between 60 to 80 pounds. Jane Doe may have had a condition called spina bifida occulta, which may not have been noticeable. Many with the condition don't even know that they have it because it is the mildest form of spina bifida. Now, there are no scars or identifiable marks on her body. She appeared to have been well-nourished before her death. There was also a yellow v-neck sweater discovered with Jane Doe's body. Jane Doe's fingernails were painted red. Her fingerprints and DNA are on file. Now, over the years, Jane Doe has been ruled out as a potential match in multiple cases. Sharon Cole, missing from Manhattan, New York, since February 25th, 1983. Johanna Sear, missing from Montreal, Quebec, Canada, since August 15th, 1978. Talithia Good, missing from Baltimore, Maryland, since September 10th, 1987. Shonda Green, missing from Ypsilanti, Michigan, since October 15th, 1983. Toya Hill, missing from Baltimore, Maryland, since March 24th, 1982. Sharice McGee, missing from Los Vegas, New Mexico, since August 1st, 1975. Sheila Quinn, missing from Chicago, Illinois, since February 27th, 1980. Sherry Truesdale, missing from Winston-Salem, North Carolina, since July 13th, 1970. Beverly Ward, missing from Junction City, Kansas, since July 4th, 1978. The partial remains of the Northampton County Jane Doe were also discovered in 1983, and it was ruled out that the remains were the rest of Jane Doe. If you have any information related to Jane Doe's identity or the identity of her killer, I would strongly urge you to contact the St. Louis Police Department at 314-615-8619. Now, what are your thoughts on today's case? Personally, I think that a parent or caregiver being involved in Jane Doe's case is unfortunately likely. Much like Opelika Jane Doe, this strikes me as odd, that there hasn't been a family who has come forward to claim the girl. I would think that any parent would want to do whatever they could to find their child if they were missing. That's not to say that Jane Doe's parents haven't. Maybe she was from a different area, maybe she had been taken a long time ago, or maybe Jane Doe's parents were already dead. If a family member wasn't responsible for Jane Doe's death, I think that the most likely suspect that we mentioned today was probably Vernon Brown. It seems that based on location and MO, he might be the closest fit for Jane Doe's killer. But at the same time, it's also very likely that none of the suspects mentioned in today's video were involved. 
I am hopeful that one day Jane Doe will be identified and her killer revealed. Now let me know what your thoughts are on today's case in the comments down below, but as always, please remember to stay respectful. And also, please help me to keep these cases in the public eye by sharing this video, someone else's video, any of the resources, share something so that someone somewhere who may know something will be inspired to come forward and potentially crack a case wide open. Thank you so much for watching today's video and I will see you all again soon for another case.